yin knows how to stand before chaos and let chaos move through it. Um, and in that same talk, she holds yang as the ability to stay present in it. Welcome, Danielle. Hello. Thank you so much for taking your time to come do the interview with me. Maybe we could just start by you telling us what you do and what you're working on. Yeah. So I'm currently one of those crazy people getting a doctorate in clinical psychology. I'm a few years in, I've got four classes left in, uh, in the program. And it's a doctorate in clinical psychology rooted in depth psychology, uh, which makes it a kind of unique program and why I sought it out. And that really leads into the work that I do prior to starting my doctorate. I trained in Ayurveda at Maharishi University and was facilitating um, Ayurveda consultations with clients. And what I found in that work was uh, <laughs> that that very important place of where psyche and soma meet. And what I found working with clients was that um, most of what I was working with physically was rooted much more in the psychological and spiritual realm and a part of my own depth psychotherapy uh, work as a client uh, led me to wanting to seek out a doctorate in, in depth psychology specifically to help support people in that way. Very cool. And that, uh, I think you told me before that your doctorate's at Pacifica? Yes. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, that's right. And, Pacifica Graduate Institute. And that's a pretty unique place, isn't it? I would say so. Yeah, it is. There's um, a lot of it's from the Joseph Campbell tradition and Jung, I believe. What other influences does that place have? Yeah, so um, it's rooted in depth psychology and our kind of forefathers in that tradition, some would say, are Carl Jung and uh, Sigmund Freud. And so we have a lot of psychoanalytic and psychoanalytical influences, meaning Jungian and Freudian and their successors afterwards and working with their, their theoretical frameworks. And as you said, with Joseph Campbell, um, there's a huge mythic component uh, at Pacifica. And so they also teach, you know, mythological studies, archetypal studies, really mm -hmm. A, a spectrum of depth psychological inquiries. Yeah. yeah. All my favorite things, which is yes. why, you're, <laughs> why I wanted you on. So beautiful. Uh, can you give a brief layman's definition of depth psychology? Sure. Yeah. So <laughs> I'll do my best. Uh, depth psychology is an umbrella term describing many different traditions. And so some of those traditions would be, you know, Jungian psychology, Freud psychoanalytic psychology. We also have existential psychology, phenomenological, uh, post-colonial, archetypal. And the thread amongst all of these different theoretical frameworks as a, to approach psychology is that each of them, whether they call it the unconscious or something different, each of them has a certain loyalty to the latent or the implicit, meaning our symptoms. It's a way of approaching the psychological that sees our symptoms, our ailments, our desires, our sufferings as communication from deeper parts of ourselves. Um, psyche also translates as soul. And so I would say that each of these traditions, um, again, they don't all use the language such as soul, but each of them 
I think the field at large is also in these discussions and has been since its inception. I don't know if I would die on this hill, but one way of thinking about it is modern mainstream psychology has a strong emphasis in both natural science and a medical model in approaching psyche and individuals and people. You know, when I was looking out at graduate programs and where I was choosing to study, uh, it, I looked among many different schools before I even got to the word human on a school's website because hmm. I experience a lot of the approach to psychology, especially in mainstream psychology. Coming from a natural science paradigm, there's a perception that there is a subject and there is an object and mm. that in in studying the object, which is the, you know, the sacred other, the person in front of you, there tends to be a removal of the observer uh, mm. in, in getting to know who that being is. And depth psychology comes from... Uh, as opposed, I, I don't know if I'd want to say as opposed to natural science, it certainly welcomes natural science, uh, but it approaches beings from a human science theoretical model, meaning that he, based in assumptions that life has meaning um, and that our symptoms are not the outcome solely of biological, neurological uh, symptoms, but they're coming from a being. Uh, who happens to have a body and happens to have a brain that we can also study with other brains. Mainstream psychology is like mainstream medicine in that it's treating the individual as an object that's just um, <clears throat> what, what can be observed. Um, exactly. The observable. It's looking at the cognitive. It's looking at the behavioral. Um, it's looking at what we can observe. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, mainstream psychology is more Western in its approach. Um, I'm still in its kind of reductionistic. Mm -hmm. It's seen um, everything is um, explainable in a um, I'll use a fancy word a Newtonian way. In the A causes B Correct. causes C. Correct. Right, and so we could reduce that yes. just to it's mechanical. So all psychology yes. is mechanical. And, um, and Newtonian is a fantastic way of designating that, I would say. Right. Yeah. It's its own. Yes. Yeah. The whole Newtonian paradigm is um, <clears throat> it's just a bunch of billiard balls in a row. And so we are mechanical, explainable, reducible. Yes. Yes. And then so if I'm then inferring basically points to um, a mystery of the subject. Um, Correct. Okay. It assumes a quantum perspective hmm. that, uh, right, to, to use my very layman understanding of quantum physics, it's uh, understanding that there's an interrelated nature, that how I am influences how you are, and how you are influences how I am. I can yeah, we're kind of going down and under, right? We're yeah. kind of going under what informs death psychology. Yeah. Yes. We're we're kind of going into like the the philosophical underpinnings of what informs death psychology, as opposed to or aside from uh, mainstream psychology. Um, death psychology deals with the nature of self, and <clears throat> that one of its natures is that it's not. Um, within the Newtonian paradigm. And <clears throat> when I hear nature of self <clears throat> that's not caused by anything, I think, well, that sounds like spirituality. That doesn't sound like psychology. So um, I believe it's from your webpage um, mm -hmm. for the, the work you do with people. Um, you use the term, and I've heard it before, and I've actually gone around and used it all the time as if I know what it means. But the, <laughs> the term is psycho-spiritual. Yeah. So what does what does psycho spiritual mean? Yeah, I'll I'll answer that in a moment. I just wanted okay. to say that um I'm not sure if depth psychology is concerned with the nature of the self. It might be, but I'm not okay. sure. Okay. Uh, I think I think Jung certainly was. Mm. I'm not sure if I perceive that as as a guiding force in the pursuit that is depth psychology. 
Um, with that said, I guess it kind of ties into what I would define psycho-spiritual as, which is, um, I've never defined that before. And I think that's in part because I hold it as partially undefinable in its nature. Um, I use the term psycho-spiritual because I felt like it was a much more honest descriptor as to what I do in my therapeutic coaching business. And I hold psycho-spiritual as, in essence, it makes the assumption that there's an eternal and it makes the assumption that we are a part of the eternal that the psychological and the spiritual to me uh to say i'm providing psychological services uh is a misnomer to what where i dwell and where i'm welcoming people to dwell uh, and pay attention to i see in a way the psycho spiritual as both the horizontal axis and the vertical axis in when I'm approaching working with life with someone or myself. Mm -hmm. uh, and what I mean by horizontal and vertical is, uh, again, kind of terms kind of intentionally without an exact definition, because I think what I'm pointing to, and there are as many depth psychological theories as there are practitioners mm. you know this is just me um yeah, yeah but i would approach that from one of the first things i heard you say was it's outside of being rational and i would wonder what's that what is rational mm -hmm. um what has designated something as rational and irrational what are we assuming there that makes you getting pissed off about a countertop an issue at all mm -hmm. from what i was hearing you say like right you're kind of I'm, I'm kind of trying to hear i'm hearing you trying to separate what are these different ideas and here we have that historical perspective right a happened long ago and now we're at g and g is happening because g followed a through h or mm -hmm. whatever what I mean by psycho-spiritual in that regard and how I was hearing you kind of separate, like there's this story that the ego is telling the self. And so we can kind of break that down and deconstruct and, you know, how would I like to be approaching that now where I am today? And how do I feel about what happened then? I think from how I approach really for me, psycho-spiritual is like a, a, Maladoma Somme is a deep inner teacher of mine, and he says that the physical is the spiritual in a lower key, mm -hmm. right? The, the, it's, it's, it's a denser, the secular is just a denser form of, of what we're in. Um, so for me, the psycho-spiritual is a, a signifier that I assume as a practitioner that what we are in, um, there is no separation between what we're in and the spiritual that is a part of what we are in. And now I'm looking at it and it's like psycho-spiritual. So these are actually kind of more like two aspects of the same thing. It's that the spiritual and the psyche are the same thing. And one of the things that the spiritual does is one of its aspects is psyche is mind yes it's felt yes it's... that's how i hold it okay yeah good mm -hmm. so this is right so this is um <clears throat> more of a whole self approach to it. yeah yeah i'm not into designating um something as holy and something as unholy yes yeah 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 that makes sense that reminds me of a quote. I don't, I'll probably get it wrong and i'll probably misquote it but the gist of it was um carl Jung saying um causality is one of you know the most fundamental of religions mm -hmm. that we hold something to that i effect. love that yeah something yeah to that effect. i'm sure you did yeah. <laughs> it's a deep fantasy and i can understand why it's terrifying to be human yeah what's the difference in your mind between um soul and psychological is there a difference and if so what is the difference between um soul and psychological complex I would say psychological complexes are one way that the soul communicates. 
differentiates soul from <clears throat> psychological complex meaning and 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 i believe romanition in in the descriptor of that book where they were coming from um is that the complex of psychology that he speaks to in a way is what james hillman has harped on in his whole body of work in that psychology has a tendency to abstract what's happening like using psychological terms to abstract from the lived phenomenon and in that it's we need to look at that you know what's going on you know a, a, a part of why i was poking earlier of like what is the rational right so mm -hmm. how is it that we've come to make these assumptions about who we are and what we're in um but to answer your specific question i see psychological complexes are like i honestly want to use the cosmos as an example if psyche is space then these grahas these planets these places of juncture of meeting of twists and turns in our own beings uh we, we can think of that spatially, right? Each of us has many creatures living in us and all of those creatures have deep relationships with themselves and with life outside. And so uh, we call complexes in Jungian psychology, which was almost called complex psychology at one point, um, complexes are like these knots in a piece of fabric that reveal both our injuries and our our gifts our beauties um they're they're places where the archetypal is being lived out personally within us uh jung said at the core of the complex is an archetype right so it's it's kind of like the inner theater and the outer theater that we have to work with that each of us has in our lives um and soul soul in a way I'll, I'll speak from kind of jung's perspective uh, we each have our own um jung sees soul or the self as the deeper orchestrating force in the psyche and that it seeks inherently wholeness and so as we are thrown around in the riotous chaotic, fragmented parts of our psyche that we call complexes, uh, the nature of them is to show us who we are and to work with them. So that's where I see our complexes as a form of the soul's communication. And again, I think where they were getting at with that book was... Uh, you know, because his book is all about how to do research with soul in mind, to not get lost in the abstracting tendency of modern psychology to lose the essence that... So the other day, um, we were having coffee, and you quoted Auden. The quote was, is, we pretend to understand the forces that love us. And I also heard you say that, um, and maybe it was on your website, but I heard you say... Um, that you privilege uncertainty and that the whole field of psychology really fears uncertainty. So why do you think that they fear uncertainty? Well, I mean, they fear uncertainty with good reason. Uh, this, this, again, we right what Auden says, we pretend to understand the forces that live us. Um, I guess for me, a lot of healing of my anxiety has come through, uh, recognizing my own limitations and that uh, I can't understand the forces that live us, right? And so I bring that because on one level, I don't think any of us with enough sanity wish to live in uncertainty. However, I think not being able to tolerate uncertainty, we can inadvertently blind ourselves by 
clinging to certainties and what that means about us and what I experience in, I'll just st stick to modern American psychology, um, where there is a strong influence for psychology to be held as a STEM discipline. And I think in the social historical time in which we find ourselves that we haven't been taught or shown how to be with mystery. Um, I think it's easy to go to war. I think it's easy to be certain about what's happening in a schizophrenic's experience. I think it's easy to claim we know a lot about what it means to be human on this planet orbiting a sun. Um, when I say I privilege uncertainty, um, it means can I be a good enough student and bear how much we don't know and what can be revealed about the world in which we find ourselves by not knowing, by not assuming we know. Mm -hmm. Is it, am I right in saying they, it would be like the same reason I fear uncertainty is that it throws me into chaos and that's very threatening, right? It's like, um, <clears throat> if I look at myself and, you know, if, if I would reduce myself to being an animal, and certainly I have a lot in common with animals, one thing I have in common with animals is <clears throat> I like, I like, um, I don't like the unexpected. I like to at least believe the illusion that I know what's going on and to, to not know what's going on is, um, can be traumatic for me, even just micro traumatic, a term I just invented. But, um, so is that, is that's, you know, that's basically it. We're just so um fixated on being certain about things i like you're bringing it into your experience and you brought up one of my favorite topics which is chaos mm -hmm. and um and then going back earlier to the other word you used which was rational and this brings up something that uh, many depth psychologists write about that um is a big deep part of what informs me and how I work, which is m mythically, and when I use the word mythically, I'm speaking to the mythos that inform our world, that are being lived out in our world, seemingly so. And when we go back to earlier renditions of Greek mythology, we see that chaos is the mother of life. <laughs> Chaos births Gaia, the Earth. She births Eros, our very life force and sense of love in the world, and Thanatos, death, right? Among others. Uh, she also birthed night in that earlier rendition of the mythology. And what we see through time is those myths change. Eros and Thanatos and Gaia are no longer birthed from chaos. Uh, but the myths transform. And what we see on a collective level is that chaos, which was once revered uh, and understood to be our mother, the goddess, has become quite perverted through time. And what I mean by perversion is like etymologically, it means to turn. So we've taken a turn away from the original movement and we see a desecration of that which is associated with chaos. We see a fear of that which is associated with chaos. And we also see uh, a deep violence towards the feminine in which she's been associated with for the last few thousand years. And I believe, and again, these are not my ideas, but many who come before me speaking to solar way of seeing, one aspect of the solar way of seeing, which values one form of logic, a very narrow view of what is rational. It values control, dominance, being certain, right? And, and 
These qualities are, are wonderful qualities. However, when they're valued before all other qualities, uh, we see the circumstances that we are in that are you know, growing more and more confrontive in the world in which we're in, both the Earth's desecration and the state of uh, us. I think there needs to be a deep renewal of trust in chaos. Um, I think that that terror of chaos is what informs a lot of destructive forms of dominance that we see. Earlier in our humanity, <clears throat> we celebrated the, um, the chaos, the, um, I'm using my words, they're the ones I know, the divine feminine, um, the great mother. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> And yes. as we've evolved, we started to shift towards um, more masculine domination. Um, <clears throat> and as you said, um, and, uh, you know, ordering, domination, technology, um, rationality. And so, um, and <clears throat> some of that's been really good. However, what is needed now is um, a retrieval of those those earlier values right of the of the chaos yeah a retrieval and a retreat yes a retrieval and an acknowledgement of what has occurred mm. i think most people have such a negative association with the word chaos so can you tell mm. me what are some of the what is good about that what does the chaos um have a value <laughs> uh what doesn't she have a value? Uh, there is a brilliant, brilliant book called Eros and Chaos, the sacred love and mis wait, the sacred shadows and mysteries of love. And that's by a death psychologist, Dr. Veronica Goodchild. And um, <laughs> she brilliantly pairs not chaos with order, hmm. but chaos with Eros. Her son, Chaos Birthed Eros. And um, I bring up this book because she has deeply influenced how I hold chaos. Uh, I see chaos as a form of love and madness. Um, and what I mean by that is that here we are, 2023, living our lives. How can we conceive? of the very primordial energies that created this. To me, chaos, uh, much like other maddening forces, such as rage or hatred or, God forbid, love, uh, they're beyond our understanding. And they're also, uh, to me, worthy of uh, reverence in that. To me, chaos is primordial and thonic and is life-giving. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so he, we can even tie this into some of your earlier questions with separating or, or forming, you know, the differences with depth psychology and modern American psychology, which we see um, a loyalty and perhaps an insane trust in what moves us that we don't understand but there is something that moves us it exists rather than not exists to me chaos is pregnant chaos is brimming with energy it is uh to me inherently filled with order i'm not too sure where we got that separation uh, and coming back to the solar chaos to, to me the apollonian and what we're current, this current form of patriarchal consciousness in which we live in is a very narrow view of what masculinity is. It's, it's rather imprisoning in a very sad way to me. And we've limited the gods. Like to me, Dionysus is a god who knows how to bow to chaos. He lets chaos move him. And Chaos to me is not inherently destructive. It's a quality, it's an energy that in these modern times that precipitously values the Apollonian 
um, none of us quite know, like tantrically in our bodies, how to hold the chaotic, right? We shut down with disassociation, we shut down with anxiety, we shut down with depression. We don't really know how to be with the aliveness that we are. And to me, um, chaos is a very good student to us or a very good teacher to us. That's funny, Freudian slip. So to me in the clinical setting and therapeutic work, madness and chaos is not to be kicked out of the room or prescribed away prematurely, but it is to learn from. It's a force of us that we do not know much about. And can we be students to that? Beautiful. I love that from my vague sense and experience of that. I couldn't agree more. The way I've experienced that or the way I would talk about that and <clears throat> see if, you know, check me is I think about it as kind of the, um, the naming of the things. It's like in the naming, hmm. we lose what it is. So, uh, <laughs> In the beginning, it's one, and then we, right. right, we cut it, right, with a sort of discernment and say, well, this is light and this is dark, this is she, this is he, yes. and we go on and we cut it yes. into many things. And of course, that those many things, the discernment has utility, but it also cuts us yes. off from, <clears throat> we'll just say, I'll just say the source from from that wildness. Mm -hmm. That um, it also feels. Um, I don't know if it's the right use of the term, but it's like libidinal in energy. Yeah. It's like, it's just pure energy. It's, yeah. it's um... Yes. To me, a libidinal energy is okay. Eros. You're bringing something up that I think is so important. Um, there's this brilliant book called uh, Master and His Emissary, and it's a, a, a neuropsychological perspective on the making of the Western mm -hmm. world, the history of the Western oh. world. And he looks at how, yeah, really, <laughs> really unique <laughs> stance and brilliant person. Um, I think it's Miguel Crest is his name. And he talks about how you know, there's this brilliant story where, you know, you think of like a master, a spiritual teacher, he sends out his emissaries across the land to spread his teachings. And the further and further the emissary gets from the master, the emissary starts to think, he is mm -hmm. the master. Well, well, I know these things, like, you know, and, and gets further away and, and he starts to teach wildly different teachings and believes he is the master. Meanwhile, he's, you know, just grown very far from yes. the master. And he uses that story to describe the making of the Western world. The right brain grows first. The left brain grows second. Oh, I didn't know that. And what we, what, yes. And what he sees is the right brain, which is deeply associated with chaos. It does not function in linear time. The right brain is primary. And what we see in the Western world is that left brain, the orderly, the organizing forces of who we are, uh, has become so far from the master that it believes it is mm -hmm. the master, right? The left brain attributes to me in, in nature's way is to be in service to the right brain, which is primary, the creative, the nonlinear. And, and what we see is a, a reversal, a diminishing of value upon right brain attributes and the left brain thinks it's mm -hmm. the master. You've forgotten about chaos. Yeah. Try to tame it. So right brain, left brain, the linear and the nonlinear. <clears throat> what do you have a sense of what the proper relationship is between those two halves? I'm, now I'm going to Jodish um, and to mythology. Um, Mars is exalted when he's in service to Venus. Um, to me, in my current limited understanding, my sense is that a world that would be more life-giving um, would be a world in which we were utilizing organizing abilities of left brain, of left brainedness. It would be a function of the right brain. It would be in service to chaos, chaos's pregnancy. It would be in service to the creative realm. I'm kind of getting away from such terminology as masculine and feminine but in while we're speaking to the primordial i think it mm -hmm. has its place and 
to me a way through that I would like to see on this planet is the masculine in life and each of us to be living in service to the feminine action and service to heart. We're going in and out of valleys and places. Well, it's, it's, um, I didn't even think about this, but it's such a great thread that, um, we got into, um, <clears throat> about the chaos. Because intuitively, it can, I very much resonate with that. And I think I just wrestled with the words. Uh, and, and so mm -hmm. intuitively, I really resonate with <clears throat> that creative life force and <clears throat> the ecstasy that it brings and the connection that it has me live from when I ra on the rare occasions that I experience it. And I think um, a lot of the efforting that I do a lot of the scheduling and organizing and <clears throat> financial management, um, a lot of the <laughs> achievement that I do is really um, probably, <laughs> and I'm just riffing, it's probably a very um, innocent and misguided way for me to get back to that. It's um, the closest thing that I really mm -hmm. know in my life is the mother, is my mother. It's like wanting to be in that back in that idyllic state with my mother when I was an infant, you know, and, and um, it seems to me that, you know, and I just use the term ego because it's the one I know is that, um, you know, it's, it has an agenda, you know, it's, um, and it's just, so everything, it's, it has a strategy to get back there. Yeah, and it's innocent. It seems like that. Yeah. I mean, it's very young. It's very, very yeah. young. I feel a lot of heart in what you're sharing, you know, how that our strategies have an innocent yeah. agenda in a way. If, yeah. you know, someone to come to you for help, you know, what are some of the simple practices or themes that you might employ to bring them back in touch Yeah. Um, on our first coffee conversation, uh, I learned you are also a lover of milk and milk's coming mm. up for me right now. Um, where he says something to the effect of, um, you know, perhaps all of the dragons in our lives are princesses wanting us to, waiting for us to act, you know, with courage, something to the mm -hmm. effect of that. And that's kind of it in essence. I don't, there are very serious and very dangerous parts of who we are. I also hold um, each part of us, perhaps even especially the very violent and dangerous parts of us are seeking life in the way that they know how to. And so, so much of how I approach um, healing work is like who who is that who is really in there and what are they really saying yeah who's the deepest part that I can hear you know coming back to what you shared there right like there's I I, I read this book by Carl Rogers like 10 years ago and um, it's now uh, informing my dissertation uh, which he he describes this potato analogy and uh, if you see a box of potatoes in a bright kitchen and you don't check on them for some while and you come and see them after some time, they'll have strong green sprouts, you know, moving towards the window light in the kitchen. If you see that same box of potatoes in a dark, damp basement and you go and check on it after some times, it will also have sprouts, but they'll be white and pale and twisted, hardly looking like mm -hmm. life anymore but it's still life seeking the light of that window in any way that I can. And so the way that I approach pathology, uh, psychopathology is, uh, you know, the, any suffering that walks into my room, um, I hold it as life trying to live the best way it knows how, you know, can I understand it on its yes. own terms, you know, yeah. And the dragons, you know, like the Rilke poem, you know, uh, 
perhaps all the dragons are princesses just waiting for us. I have deep respect for the dragon storming and blazing for as long as the dragon needs to storm and blaze. Um, we hold a lot of pain and those pain that needs to be sung and blessed in some way. So it can often look like a painful journey, but I often find that pain really just wants to be felt, um, which is kind of back to something I said in our coffee talk, which I remember you had a look on your face. So I was like, oh, I don't think that landed quite right, which was, I think, you know, at the end of the day, we're, we're, we're all really learning how to suffer well. Um, yeah. That was a good one. Um, <clears throat> I think the, yeah, my, my look was probably like, well, I'm really good at suffering. What you were just saying. Um, so le allowing the dragons, hearing what they have to say, uh, giving them their life, in, yeah. in my words, allowing them to have their life. Yeah. And then what do you do after that, if anything? What does the princess want to do? What yeah, do they have I think to I'm, say? Like another way of me, what I'm trying to ask is, you know, what are the, what are the agents mm. or what is the mechanism, if there is one, of transformation? Mm. I find that transformation knows well what to okay. do on its own. <laughs> and what I mean by that is uh, um, I'm pulling from Jung and psychoanalysis and honestly, mainly different indigenous teachers that I study and I've learned from. And in that it's can i hear nature and let nature do what it does i don't think we have to figure out transformation i think that transformation is a natural process when we bring our attention to our own lives and do so with earnesty and uh, helping bring the unconscious to consciousness. And to me, that doesn't necessitate fancy strategies or homework or intensives. That's utilizing your birth rate of attention. Um, and hopefully with a loving presence that can help you. I think each of us needs that. Yeah. I'll say it back in my own basic layman way, totally. the picture I'm painting, listening to you, it's really that um, our original state or our true nature is good. And we have, for some reason, we get cut off from that or we get caught up in a knot. And mm -hmm. because we fall. fall. Yeah. And that is a fascinating <laughs> mechanism in itself. But, um, <clears throat> mm -hmm. uh, why would we make that mistake? Why would we lose touch with our own nature, right? And so, mm -hmm. so given that that's our true nature, then all that's necessary is to allow and to, you know, and so psychological parlance is to not suppress, to not repress, to welcome, to allow, and then it will return to its natural state. Yeah. We're saying it so simply, but it's yeah. so much yeah. harder. <laughs> like yeah. easier said yeah. than well, done. Definitely yes. my experience. Yes. I, uh, I'm, a, I'm a hard case yeah. for sure. So, oh. but you know, <laughs> so got it. And I May I share some, uh, th there's this thing that keeps poking me this whole Please. time we've been talking and I want to share it, which is um, one kind of simple way that I see this thing we're in. Uh, that kind of gets to a few points you've brought in up and particularly the mother piece. Um, I forget even where I pulled this from. Jung certainly speaks to it. My dear mentor shared it with me um, and the alchemists knew it too. And what it is is, you know, if we take the origin myth uh, in the West, the, the book of Genesis, the garden of Eden, First, we have undifferentiated, unconscious union, right? And we need to fall. We need the severing. And so here, 
Eve did us the great sacrifice of eating the apple, which gave her the knowledge of good and evil. So moving from undifferentiated union to separation, now we have good and evil, we have duality. And through the opposites, we are able to wrestle with the opposites in order to come to another union. But now it's no longer submerged in unconsciousness. It's yeah. a conscious yeah. union, right? It's here I stand amongst yeah. the opposites. The, so the suffering is perfect. Um, and I'm glad you caught my yeah. weird look. I said something along the lines of, and I'm looking to my phone because uh, I have a post I want to speak to on this. Um, I was saying that uh, at the end of the day, I think, uh, you know, we're all just learning how to suffer well. And I want to get into one of my other favorite topics, which is etymology, because I looked up the etymology of, oh, here it is, pain and suffering. I'll challenge what you said earlier. I think us fours know all about pain um, and Psychic pain is very different than suffering. Psychic pain is stuck. Psych psychic pain is wallowing. It's a stuckness. It's, mm -hmm. There's no movement. Suffering is the ability to digest pain. Right? And uh, so etymologically, pain is connected to punishment, atonement, and retribution. It comes from poena or poin, where Latin uh, sufferings, it comes from Latin suffrere, meaning to bear, to carry, to endure, to undergo. So for me, that's where I think the heart of so much therapeutic work is uh, learning how to be human, which mm -hmm. involves a lot of pain and how to carry and bear and undergo uh, the journey of suffering. Got it. Pain. Got it. So, yes. Yeah, so I think yeah. that makes a lot of sense. <clears throat> I think where my life came from is like, well, all right. You know, what I know about me is um, I can really, <clears throat> in fact, it's a lifestyle to suffer. Like, you know, in fact, <laughs> I will look for opportunities to suffer so in other words so i think what i get it i think what i'm seeing is like <clears throat> there is the in inherent suffering of life right? it's um and we can go into that and we you know and maybe we will you know as the buddha you know life is suffering and then we can because it's not all that you know when somebody hears that off the top it's like oh well th that's all there is to it um it's only suffering and there's no right. way out and welcome to hell right. <clears throat> and uh, that's pretty bleak, but um, so there's yes. there's being human, and learning to suffer is really learning to be human, how to metabolize that, um, at probably at its best, um, to let go of that, mm -hmm. right, um, and then to bear it. To bear yes. it. Yes, and uh, and we I like to talk about the too about bearing that because it's not obvious what that means to people i have some i think i have some understanding of where you're coming from but i definitely want to hear mm -hmm. what you mean um and and then there is the psychic suffering of wallow of really um yeah, yeah right. so pain. i'll relate i can only relate from where i come from which is um a lot of it is the stoics and the you know the byron katie um philosophy which is um there are, i had a feeling yeah, you liked it's the just, stoics it's, it's, yeah. <laughs> so um one of the stoics um Epictetus, i think they're all pretty much the same as far as i can tell but um is he, one of them said that it's not the events in our lives that are the problems it's our thoughts about the events in our lives is the problem so that's is that the psychic pain that you're referring to the undo suffering i want to go a little deeper um in a way yes um for me 
the Stoics and Byron Katie uh, put more stock in story and thought than I do. Um, I also don't try to get rid of them. I, I value our stories and our thoughts. Um, but uh, in a way, yes, that is what I mean. Coming back to etymology, grief comes from the same root word as praise. And so a part of what I'm speaking to with bearing pain, learning how to suffer, and learning how to suffer the pain inherent in life, um, it's can we hold our experiences and learn how to hold them in right proportion in our own lives? Um, and that doesn't mean rewriting, and that doesn't mean bypassing, and that doesn't mean um, rearranging. It just means I'm alive. I'll meet a lot of people and a lot of animals and a lot of plants and a lot of elements and they will die and I will die. And that's kind of what we're guaranteed. Um, and, and that sets us up for a lot of loss and a lot of praise. Um, so how we need to hide at times, we need to get stuck at times, but how to show each other and ourselves how to not be alive. And how does that set us up for praise? What do you mean when you say that? Um, so now I'm taking from my own tradition, uh, as articulated by Martine Prechtel. He married a Mayan woman many years ago and became deeply connected with this Mayan village in Guatemala. And among their teachings from this Mayan village, uh, they don't see grieving as separate from praising. Grieving is a form of praising what was um, or what wants to be. Um, it's an honoring of life to acknowledge the pain of life. Beautiful. So it's not, grief is not lament for them. It's not a complaint. No, it's, 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 it is lament. And it is complaining and yelling at the gods, but it's also recognizing um, that it's all here for us, hmm. um, right? Like, if if I love the mother, the great mother, and sh if she is the great mother, can I not fucking right. hate her too, and still love yes. and be loved by her, right? It's it's a yes. part of what we're in. So I'm going to um, pin a word to you, and that word's acceptance. That seems to be the theme that I keep getting. Mm. Like, that's the most, like, you know, that's what comes through for yeah. me. Is that fitting? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I would say so, yeah. And, and, ex and something I'd like a like, little yeah. asterisk <laughs> next to accepting, which is... Uh, you know, it's not passive, it's not soft, it's not just sitting in some flaccid, receptive stance. It's, can I be with what's happening? Um, this beautiful uh, psychologist, Barbara, um, fuck, Barbara, something Stevens, she has a hyphenated name, but she talks about, you know, so much of modernity in this pressure to be right rather than wrong, to be in control rather than falling apart, you know, all this pressure we have in our world. Can we stay related when the seduction of narcissism, the safety of narcissism is constantly there, right? Can we bear, right? And, and to me that, um, is full of acceptance, right? But I, I, now I'm curious about the etymology of acceptance because to me, it mm. takes a lot of courage. That's a great point. Yeah. That's when it gets exciting. So yeah, I really like what you said there. Um, acceptance isn't passive. Acceptance, yes, it has an association. Right. I get into that all the time with clients. And it's, you know, and you see it mm. all the time with, um, 
<clears throat> the whole stoic loving what is thing. It's like, so I'm just supposed to be okay with all the children dying. Yeah. To me, this actually fuels the stoics and some of this metaphysical stuff. It, to me, this fuels hatred of the feminine, uh, uh, because it creates such a narrow binary of, uh, I'm going to speak specifically to men that identify as men. Um, it gives such a narrow view of what it is to be allowed, to, like what is allowed to be, um, when we associate when we associate words and qualities with femininity and associate femininity with weakness or passivity, it narrows how we're allowed to be in the world. And uh, that's bullshit. Um, that's a clinical term. I love it. Yeah. So acceptance is agentic to use a $2 word. So this is what's really fascinating. So, um, so how to suffer well, so let's start back from the top. So how to suffer well is accepting life and all that it brings to bear. And accepting doesn't mean rolling over either. It means engaging, I yes. take it. So it's, it's also learning to suffer is also yeah. a way to learn to engage with the suffering. Yeah. All right. Yes. And I think, therefore, makes us much more engaged citizens in the world. That's been my experience. Yeah. Um, when I've <clears throat> either yeah. when I've been cut open, or you know, whatever analogy you want to use, hitting over the head of a hammer, <clears throat> be it spiritually yeah. or emotionally or physically, I feel much more alive. Yeah. And it's not that it doesn't hurt. <laughs> um. But you know what? I would take that hmm. over yeah. the other way, the usual way, which is really trying to yeah. order my life. <clears throat> so, you know, to live in air conditioning, as an analogy, to live in a home with air conditioning and heat. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good one. Yes. Yes. We, we, I have, again, I have a lot of respect for our defenses. We need them. Um, Right. But when when do our defenses, you know, instead of creating a safe homeostasis, it starts to lock us in that house where we're numb to yeah. both the pain and yeah. beauty of life. You know, I think a tenant of depth psychology is to look for yes. the opposite. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm only seeing this. Where's the other? You know, what's happening in, in the opposite? Um, as a form of like the compass, you know, finding one's way. And I do love what you're bringing up and, and actually I'll bring up the yin and yang. There's a brilliant talk. It's a, it's one of my litmus tests for <laughs> dating new suitors. Uh, it's a, it's a talk called, uh, uh, it's out of the Mocha Dao Institute just sold by Ginevra, uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, um, but it, it's a talk on the true yang and sexual predation. And in that talk, she identifies the yin as that which is able to hold the thonic, to hold the primordial. In a way, yin knows how to stand before chaos and let chaos move through it. Um, and in that same talk, she holds Yang as the ability to stay present in it. You had mentioned Psyche and Soma. But, I'd love to hear about that. Yeah. Um, I remember speaking amongst colleagues at some point. Like, I, I wish we had a third word that didn't separate Psyche or Soma. Um, I'm really of the mind that the physical is the spiritual in denser form. And so I'm really grateful for my studies in Ayurveda prior to entering the world of depth psychology, because I see Ayurveda to live very close to alchemy and also 
it understands that consciousness is physiology physiology is consciousness and when i entered the depth psychology world um and and specifically uh marian woodman's work she she beautifully and directly says the body is the unconscious and then goes as far to say that body work is soul work and i completely resonate with both of those sentiments um i see soma which has many meanings in sanskrit uh, but in this particular scope um i mean it in terms of our embodiment I see the body almost as a metaphor. I see the body as the language of the soul or psyche. Um, one of the ways it powerfully expresses itself um, that older traditions such as you know, traditional Chinese medicine and Ayurveda had a very deep understanding that I see modern science to just begin to start validating through their methodologies um, the profound interrelatedness between psyche and soma that I really believe we're, we barely understand and um, I hope to see more movement and I think that's a huge important area. Thank Excellent. <laughs> I appreciate the opportunity Thank you so for much coming Gabriel. On. Thank, Thank you, you for spending time here with me explaining this yeah. all to me as best you as I could understand it so and yeah. if um, yeah. people are more interested they want to learn more about you how how can they contact you or find out more you all can contact me uh, most easily through my website beingwovenhome.com I'm also on Instagram at beingwovenhome and my contact information is on there beanwovenhome.com mm -hmm. Thank yes. you, Daniel.